I knew immediately that we needed him here at Nexus Live. It is the intellect, experience, and commitment to research of people like Dr. Washburn who enable us to be better skilled educators to hone our craft of teaching informed by research and the science of learning. So please join me now in welcoming our friend, Dr. Kevin Washburn. Thank you. Uh, we have arrived at this point in this event where we are uh, at the optimal time for minimal learning. <laughs> You've had lunch. You've been sitting for a while. Um, so if you want to look at your watch and think right now about what time it would be, what point you would be in in the school day, this is how your students probably feel. And we'll talk about why in just a few moments. When we understand learning, we're able to make better decisions about our teaching. So let's take a look at what I call these core processes of learning. The first is experience. Now experience is happening any time that sensory data is entering your nervous system. So right now, hopefully you're hearing the sound of my voice, you may be seeing visuals, um, but there are also other things that as soon as I mention them, you'll be aware of, like the feel of the chair beneath you. Now hopefully, when you leave here today, you're not going to be talking about the feel of the chair beneath you. Hopefully that is not what you're attending to. There is some data that we attend to and, and other that we pretty much ignore. But experience, what we call experience, is happening anytime. Anytime our, our nervous system is, is picking up sensory data. I liken experience to riding a roller coaster. Now, I love roller coasters. Any roller coaster fans out there? A few. All right, excellent, excellent. My wife is not a roller coaster fan. But she likes to ride because she thinks it's great fun to watch me laugh. And as soon as we crest that first hill, you know, that, that, that moment just before the train drops, I start to laugh. And I laugh all the way through the entire ride. Now, we have friends of ours, good friends of ours, who will often, uh, if we go to an amusement park, will go with us, but they will often get to the biggest roller coaster in the park, and they'll decide to, you know, sit this one out. Kind of, they're not really scared, they just want to sit this, take a break and sit this one out. But they're always asking, as soon as we've ridden the roller coaster and I come down off the, off the ride and, and, and uh, meet them down at the bottom of the ramp, they'll say, how was it? Oh, it was great. How is it different from the one on the other side of the park? It's really big. And it's really fast. And you should have been there. And they'll be like, well, how is it different? It went really fast. Now, I had experience. There was a whole lot of sensory data coming at me as I rode that roller coaster, especially since I'm one of those people who loves the front car of a roller coaster, right? All the sensory. But did I learn that roller coaster? No. No. Why? Because experience only initiates learning. It's necessary, you must have it, but by itself, it will not get you to learning. Which brings us to something we've been told all of our lives about experience. Well, you've probably heard time and time again that experience is the best. That's a lie. Experience by itself is not the best teacher because experience by itself only initiates the learning process. If I really wanted to learn that roller coaster, I would need to ride it several more times, and it would be really helpful to me if the operator would pause it at certain points. <laughs> because there's more that I've got to do in here to really learn that roller coaster. Why? Why can't I just ride it once and get it and have it? Why, when we say things to students, can't they just remember them? Because raw experience by itself is not the best teacher. The brain requires downtime. Now, some people say, Kevin, I really don't like the term downtime. So don't, if you don't like that term, think of it as processing time. 
The brain requires processing time. That is, the brain requires time to think through the experience, the incoming sensory data that the nervous system has collected. Your brain was not created to absorb everything and remember it for all eternity, thankfully. I mean, you don't want to remember all the sensory data that comes into your nervous system. A lot of it's not that important. So in order to really learn, we have to plan for some downtime. Now, here's the thing about downtime. Your students take downtime whether you plan for it or not. Okay? You're lecturing away, and you're doing your, you know, you, your most stellar lecture, and uh, you think that, boy, this is such great information. I'm presenting it with such passion. Everybody's right with me, but I'll tell you what. A few minutes into it, some of your students were elsewhere. They were thinking about whatever the most emotionally pressing information in their lives at the moment is, which might be the ball game after school, the fight with a sibling on the way to school, Christmas, whatever it is. And they're going to take downtime and they're going to check out mentally for a couple minutes and then they'll be back with you for a little while. So here's the thing about downtime. As a teacher, if I plan downtime, I get to use it to my advantage. I get to direct it. Instead of having students check out and think about the ball game after school, I get to say, okay, time out. Think about this for a moment. But you've got to plan it. You can't lecture for 42 minutes and expect that they're going to absorb everything you said. The brain is not created for that kind of memory. 